And over to you, Colleen. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Colleen Aversa with Liquitex. I will be your moderator today. And I'm joined by artist Morla Morrison, who will be instructing you on how to create this colorful, relaxing abstract painting using Liquitex acrylic gouache and soft body acrylic paints. So before we get started, um, as Felicia noted, we just want to remind everyone this class is recorded. So if you're hanging out with us today and watching and you want to paint this another time, or if you feel like you missed something while painting along, you can always rewatch the class um, when it's posted 24 to 48 hours from now. So also keep your eye on the chat throughout the class. We'll be posting some links and information there that you might find helpful. And if you do have any questions, just pop them on there and we'll do our best to get them answered for you. So I hope everybody enjoys the class today. And with that, I'll hand it over to Marla. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, I've been really looking forward to this class. So thanks a lot for spending some of your time with me today. And in case we haven't met before, I'm an artist in North Texas, and I'm also a wife and a mom to three kiddos. We have a 15-year-old son and 10-year-old twins, a boy and a girl. So I totally get that whole juggling act of, you know, having work and family and then also making time for your own painting practice. So kudos to all of you who are here, because I know sometimes in the world of things, making time for painting is like one of the last things that we make time for. So uh, thanks for, for doing that. So I one reason I've been looking forward to this class so much is I, I love acrylic paint and I feel like this project highlights some of the neat attributes that acrylics can do for you. Um, in my own work too, I really like to explore the concept of different visual textures like gloss versus matte, uh, opaque versus transparent. And in this specific piece, we're gonna really play on those things. So I think it will be fun and like Colleen said, relaxing. So that being said, let's get started. All right, so if you do just love art materials like I do, um, here are three uh, sites I wanted to mention that you may wanna give a follow to. One is called TFACNA, or TF yeah, or TFACNA, it stands for the Fine Art Collective, North America. And I'm an artist on this channel as well. And we'll have various like hour long IG lives, um, usually one or two a week. And we'll talk about all sorts of art material related things from acrylic to oil color to colored pencils and so on. And there's also a ton of little mini demos that you might find fascinating. And then this is me at Marla Morrison Art. I do acrylic painting and resin work. And I, I like to think of myself as an art materials explorer. So I like to try like all sorts of different materials. So if that interests you, you can find me there. And then last but not least, uh, the brand of materials we're using today is Liquitex. So this is a great site to follow at Liquitex Official. And you'll see all sorts of great info on uh, you know, all the Liquitex products, lots of artists that they'll uh, interview and talk about different artist residencies. So again, if you're into all things art related, those are some good sites to follow. So here's the piece. Um, it's a lot of ovals. And I think of this as like a complementary color scheme because it's mainly blues and orange. The gold, the gold here skews to orange. And then this pink, I'd say, is like an analogous color to the orange. So all that being said, if you're someone who prefers like red and green or violet and yellow, you could play those complements off each other with this similar idea. I like that because it makes it a fairly limited range of color, but with those limits, you can see there's a whole lot of variety. So the limits give it some unity, but the mediums and the sheen and texture differences give it a variety, okay? So I'll refer to this many times, so I'll just put it over here. And we're working on a nine by 12 pre-prime canvas. If you have something different, that's totally fine. This is an abstract, so you can fill it as you desire. But uh, this is what I'm starting with. And as Colleen mentioned, we're using our Liquitex acrylic gouache, three colors from that, and then using the Liquitex acrylic soft body color. So we'll talk about those differences. And then I also have a filbert brush, Liquitex freestyle filbert, uh, palette knife, palette paper, water. And uh, one thing to mention, I'm not sure if it was on the um, side or not. I have an embossing tool or if you have a hair dryer handy in case you want to blow dry different layers, um, you might want to grab that quickly. Or, or again, don't worry if, you, if you're not painting, you can always do that later. Okay, so uh, since we're building up layers of color, we're obviously going to start with one and then kind of stack, almost like building a foundation and then building subsequent floors, right? So our first layer is going to be this color called primary blue. It is a gouache color. 
And let me show you the difference in case you've never used the two. Um, the packaging on the gouache and the soft body is identical except for the cap. The gouache is a black cap, soft body is going to be a white cap. The texture, when you squeeze it out, you'll notice they're quite similar. It's kind of like a heavy cream, but the real difference comes in when the color dries. Uh, the gouache colors are all about being matte and mostly opaque when dry. Soft body is semi-gloss to um, satin when dry. And the color or the pigments are going to be transparent to opaque depending on the different individual characteristics. So that will play out as we mix with mediums and so on and or with the glazing medium in this piece. Okay, uh, so we'll put that there. But I'll go ahead and squeeze out the primary blue. And also too, we're talking about transparency versus opacity. If ever you're in doubt what a particular color you know, where it skews, we'll put on all of our labels a little square. It'll either be black to show it's naturally opaque, or it will be white or open, depending on the packaging, to show that it's naturally transparent. And then if it's, um, you know, half black, half white, that tells you it's somewhere in between, like a semi-opaque, okay? All right, so my primary blue is a naturally opaque color. And I'm going to squeeze some out, because when you look at this piece, we have one, two, three, four, and a half, so like four and a half ovals with the primary blue. I, guys, I tend to squeeze out probably more than you need. So if you feel like I'm being a little too liberal with it, feel free to use less, but I just, I like to make sure I have enough. Um, and I will say that gouache can be deceiving. A little goes a long way because it spreads so smoothly and evenly. So do be aware that you know, you don't need to put a ton on your palette. I'd say this is about a little less than a half teaspoon. And I'm gonna add a little bit of our titanium white. This is great to show too that you can fully intermix, not just layer, but you can intermix soft body with gouache. So I'm gonna be using the, I'll just put some of the titanium white over here and take my palette knife and I'll probably, I don't need a lot. So usually what I do in that case, I'll just take a little dab of the white and start mixing it in. Cause I just want that primary blue to be a little bit creamier or more pastel when it's dry there. I just took another little scoop uh, cause I want it to be a little bit lighter. And I don't know if you've noticed this, if you've worked with acrylics and noticed this, but um, acrylic color has a tendency to do something called color shift or value shift. So this color will be slightly darker when dry. I actually embrace that quality um, with acrylics because I kind of, I'm so used to it. I kind of like seeing how my painting might have changed slightly, you know, overnight. If you're an oil painter switching to acrylics, that can be a little frustrating because oils don't do that. So just be prepared that um, acrylics do have that value shift or, or um, color shift. All right, just gonna wipe my palette knife off and then dip my brush in. And as I look at this, I am gonna try and get similar. Again, I'm not gonna try and copy it exactly, but I do wanna block in some of the larger ovals in a similar pattern. So I'll start with this here. And these aren't, you know, perfect um, geometric ovals. They are just ovalesque, right? They are ovally, however you want to say it. Um, but uh, it's just a fun, loose geometric. I mean, not perfect geometric, but like a, just a geometric organic shape. There's a word I was looking for, organic. And that filbert brush head works really nicely for the rounded, um, parts of the oval, let's zoom a little bit now, uh, because it's a very easy to you, uh, move the brush on its tip to round out the sides. And does that make sense? See how I'm rounding it out? Not to say that you couldn't do that with a flat brush, but I've just found the filbert works really nicely for most any shape I'm trying to work with. Now, I say that you're gonna find another artist who said, nope, who, who will say, no, I prefer brights or I prefer flats. So part of that is just your own artistic preference, but you know, I think it is good if you don't have a strong preference, it's good to try different brush shapes and see, hey, do I like a flat for this type of uh, work or do I prefer the filbert and so on. If you're not familiar, a flat looks just like this, but instead of being rounded, it has a flat like perpendicular edge to the base of the brush. So that's what I mean when I say flat. <laughs> So I'm doing another kind of oval, kind of nodding inwards to the first. 
kind of like they're coexisting on here, having a little conversation. I don't know. <laughs> but they're going to be living on this space together. So kind of tilting them towards each other. And hopefully you can see how easily this color spreads. It, uh, it's just very creamy and smooth. And I'll raise this up. So you can see a little bit of brush texture right now. When this dries, the gouache and both soft body and gouache are really good about minimizing brush stroking. Um, and so any kind of texture variation you see will be very, very minimized when it dries. Also, this sheen that you see is going to go away because, like I mentioned before, the gouache colors are going to be opaque. Now you might say, well, wait, you added some soft body. What is that going to do? I added a very small amount of the titanium white. So you, while you, it, it is true that if you mix soft body and gouache, like if I did like a 50-50 mix, or if I just had a tiny amount of gouache with a whole lot of soft body, it may not be as opaque as it typically would have been. But in this case, I used just a tiny amount of the white. So my mix is gonna remain um, pretty uh, matte. And it's also gonna be opaque because titanium white is also an opaque, an opaque color, okay? All right. I've got another little oval peeking up at the bottom here. So let's put one there. And kind of rough that in. Just round it off. And two, if you felt more comfortable um drawing this out first making sure you like the composition you could certainly do that uh, like if you like i really want certain ovals here and certain ovals there you could certainly use a very light pencil and draw in your oval shapes and then just like kind of color you know color by number fill in your oval shapes with the various colors i just prefer to kind of work um more spontaneously and just fill it in as I go, because already I can see compared to the original, I've shifted the spacing a little bit. So I may need to add another oval here or there for, for the sake of my composition. Um, when I'm doing abstract pieces, you know, I, I am looking at the whole piece and I'm trying to imagine how does my eye flow across the surface? Is there any spot that I feel like needs another element there? Um, you know, uh, as I'm looking, do I feel like there's a, there's a gap that I'd really rather not be there? And if that's the case, like I know I didn't want another oval right here. I wanted, uh, but I still want that color reflected. So I'm going to add it, you know, falling off the edge. So it's a way to get that, to bring that color over to this part of the canvas, but not commit the whole space to another large oval. Um, and then likewise over here, as I kind of scan, you know, one rule of thumb, you don't always have to follow this, but typically when you're composing elements, it's nice to have odd number. Um, I'll do this a little bit. It's nice to have an odd number. <laughs> I'm trying to straighten things, sorry. It's nice to have an odd number of, uh, sorry guys, don't get dizzy. Okay, it's nice to have an odd number of elements. So here I've got four of this color. So now I'm gonna add one more of this primary blue plus white right over here. And this time I'm gonna vary the size. These are similar. I'm gonna make one that's a little bit smaller because that's another thing that you can um, vary for interest is in these ovals is different slight uh, shape variation. You see how these ovals are different, but also different sizing. This one's a little smaller uh, than the others. So it gives it a little kind of uniqueness there. All right. Now, I'm trying to spread this fairly thinly because I do want to, you know, help it dry as quickly as possible since we're in a class and we want to keep layering. Um, but I think, and I think what we'll do now is when you look at the original, the blues are separate from the next color I want to use, which is this CAD free red light. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and let this dry while we do our next color. So all I do now is typically, I mean, this is pretty basic, but I do like to mention in case you're new to painting with acrylics, whenever I have excess paint on my brush, I'll just take a paper towel and I'll wipe it off first before I put it in the water. That does a couple of things. Um, one, it keeps less you know, paint out of your water. So it's less 
water changing, but two, when you put paint on a paper towel, it can then dry and be disposed of and less of it would go into um, wastewater. So whenever I always try to wipe off excess paint before I rinse it in the um, wash water. Okay, the next color I'm gonna use is Cad Free Red Light. You may have heard of cadmium colors, but maybe not cadmium free before. So let me mention what those are. Um, cadmium colors are uh, great colors. They, they exist in soft body, you know, all of, I think, and maybe not in our inks, but in, or sprays, but in our soft body, heavy body and gouache, we ha have had genuine cadmiums. Well, a few years ago, Liquitex um, did a lot of R&D on this concept of a cadmium free color. So this is a pigment that acts and behaves like a genuine cadmium, which be, would be opaque and vibrant without having to use the actual heavy metal called cadmium. Um, so if, if you're familiar with cadmiums, that, that is something you may have heard of, but if, if it's new to you, just know that it's a way to come up with a color that behaves like a genuine source without having the extra health and safety concerns. Um, there are cadmium colors in plastics and auto paint and all sorts of things around our world um, that we still use in the US at least, but uh, I think Liquitex is on the front side of things thinking about how industries are gonna move forward and can we have paints that are gonna get rid of heavy metals? So this was one answer to that. So the cadmium free light, I've squeezed out about Again, a little less than a half a teaspoon. And when you look at this, I am going to put one, two, three and a, and a half of the Cad Red Light. So let's do that. I got a little flake in here, let me get it out. <laughs> okay. All right. I love putting these two particular colors down because they're just so vibrant. And I like how, it, I mean, this sounds maybe kind of weird to say this way, but I like how it excites my eyes. It's like, especially since these are complementary colors, it's just, it's that vibrating effect, right? Um, and so this is to me, one of the really enjoyable parts of painting is playing colors off of each other. How are they gonna react in the space together? Because as soon as you add that orange to the blue, it was kind of a calm, soothing color, right? But then we add this and now it's like, it's just as vibrant as the orange, just in a different hue, right? So if you get really into color theory, that can be a fun way to work. Um, thinking about how colors behave and what effects they have on us as the viewer. And there's all sorts of interesting um, reading out there on, on color theory. So let's put another one here and we'll make it a little taller, maybe not quite as wide. And brush it in. Yeah, look at that, just super electric and vibrant. Kind of like an abstract nod to little Easter eggs. Yes, yeah, <laughs> very uh, modern kind of vibrant Easter eggs, I would agree. Jelly, yeah, jelly beans <laughs> Easter eggs. Great, now you're making me hungry, Colleen, thinking about canned. <laughs> okay. Jelly beans, that was a better one. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. All right, so now we're gonna, I want, as I'm looking back, I do wanna focus a band of ovals in the center, but I wanna have a few, either like, I think Colleen had, I liked her idea of analogy of bubbles for a project we've done before. So kind of like maybe bubbles escaping or bubbles rising, but I want the bulk of my design kind of in the center here. So I am going to add a little bit of like a floating oval or jelly bean or egg kind of just rising off the, the edge here and just quickly sketch that in or paint that in. And then where else? We're gonna, I want just a little glimmer. Cause again, as I look at this, I'm like, well, okay, I'm liking it so far, but I think this needs a little nod to this color. Now this is a case where I'm gonna leave four shapes. So rules are made to be broken with, with uh, painting. I mentioned the you typically want to have an odd number, not always, but sometimes you can have an effective composition with an even nod to each color. 
So we'll just paint that in here. And almost like, well, I don't know why this popped in my head, but like dance moves. You're, you're adding to the dance, how you want the eye to go across the surface. What, how are you, not that you're trying to control the viewer, but you wanna, you wanna lead them on the path that, that you've created for them or yourself as a viewer. All right, so I think it's, these are not quite, let me see, let me see what's next. So what do I wanna do next? I'm gonna do that. I think I wanna do my phthalo blue color. So this deeper blue, I think is the one I wanted to do next. And we are gonna overlap. So I'm gonna take a break real quick and um, use my embossing tool to kind of help touch dry these colors a little bit. So excuse the noise. Okay, so that really got the blue completely dry. I'm gonna let the red dry on its own a little bit longer because I still, I need to, I want to change the, this phthalo blue color slightly by adding some yellow. So we'll mix it and then I will work on every area but where it overlaps the red and see if that buys us a little more time. Okay, so for the phthalo blue, we are gonna be using a soft body color. It's phthalo blue green shade. That just means that it's going to skew more towards a green bias. Um, colors can have different bias uh, or sometimes you hear temperature, like this is a warm red, this is a cool red. I think a little more precise way to think about it is the concept of bias. You can have four biases, I think that's how you say it, for color. You can have green, yellow, red, or blue. And so for this particular, for a blue, you can have a green or, a, um, or yellow or a, or I'm sorry, you can have a green, or a um, red bias. Red would lean towards violet. Green obviously is going to lean towards green. So this will be good because I kind of want a slight turquoise, which is more of a um, greenish blue. So for my yellow that I'm gonna add to that phthalo blue green shade, it's yellow medium azo. Man, you just need a very tiny amount, like super tiny, okay? Yeah, because this phthalo blue is a transparent color. And when it comes to mixing transparent colors with other transparent colors, um, you don't need a lot uh, because that transparency will let the color show through. Like think of stacking pieces of stained glass. You're letting the color show through and, and uh, uh, I guess that's the best way I can say it. It's like, you, it's not like you're trying to mix something into a paint color that's obscured. The transparent color is open and you're gonna be able to see what you mix with it. So this is already a tiny amount, tiny amount of yellow. I'm just gonna use a dab on my palette knife and mix it. Phthalo blues are, I think, very popular blues. They are very strong colors. A uh, little goes a long way. Um, and you can already see that even though this is a dark value blue, because it's transparent, it's letting that yellow show through. And also since it's a green shade, it's letting that yellow just change it ever so slightly more turquoise. I'm gonna add just a tiny bit more and just mix that together. But I think the phthalos are popular because they, you, you know, you can get these lovely color ranges, but also that transparency is just so jewel-like. I just, um, they're really nice colors to have in your palette. They can be a little frustrating if you're, if, if you're new to these colors though, because they are pretty dominant. A friend of mine would call them phthalo bullies. So be, you know, just the more you practice with them, the more comfortable you'll get with them, but they, they are powerful colors. A little goes a long way. Just kind of remember that if you're using a phthalo. Okay, so let's, where's one that I can put in where it's not gonna overlap too dramatically? Or let me check my red. Let me check. So this is the scientific way. You just stick your finger on it. I'm gonna dry, I'm gonna shoot a little more of the heat on here real quick.
Now, when I use a heat tool with acrylics, you see how I'm moving it around and I'm trying not to get too close to the surface. This embossing tool is a little um, less heated than my hair dryer, so that's why it can be a little bit closer, but um, I do constantly keep it moving across the surface. All right, so let's go ahead and um, so I look at the original. I think I'll put my phthalo, this uh, oval over here in first. So go ahead and do that. This is a little bit more of a fun kind of less ovally shape that has some character to it. Almost a little squared at the bottom. And again, those slight variations add interest to your composition. And I'll put a little bend in it here and then just smooth it out. Now, not to say that you couldn't, you know, make this with very uniform ovals. That'll just give you a different feel, right? Whenever it's super uniform, I think of it as being a little more um, like a pattern, like a very specific pattern. When I see something where each shape is like this kind of un uh, more unique and um, has a character to its own. To me, that looks a little more kind of handmade and or hand designed. So it's, just, it's really your personal preference on that. Let me change this top just a little bit. Let's square it out just a little. Okay. All right, and then we'll add. Now this is where I did slight overlap there, but this is where it's going to get fun, <laughs> even more fun. I love the glaze layering. Glazing is the concept of layering colors without physically mixing them on a surface. And again, back to the stained glass, it's where you look through layers of color for, for new and unique colors. So up here, you're going to see that um, as I draw this or paint this oval in, it is going to cover part of that CAD free red light. And I will tell you that it's hard to see a lot of difference now, but when it dries, sorry, I keep hitting my phone with my long brush, but when this color dries, you're gonna see a little more variation in the overlap. Okay, smooth that edge. With the transparent colors too, you're going to see a little more evidence of brush stroking. And again, to me, that's not a problem. That just adds to the interest in variety. But um, just be aware that is going to happen. Okay, we've got a nice oval here that actually overlaps both of these. So let's go ahead and paint that one in. And it's kind of just like it's hanging out here with these two shapes. And you can, this is a little easier to see. Hopefully you can see how that blue, and again, it'll be more obvious when it dries, but this blue on top of that red is making kind of a darker, deeper blue. And then obviously the, the dark phthalo on the lighter blue um, is also gonna just give a different visual blend of blue underneath the two. So it's what that stacking that really is fun because it's going to make colors that it'd be pretty, pretty it would be hard to um, mix and just paint in. I mean, you'd be doing a lot more color mixing where all we have to do to get color variation is layer, right? Uh, so that's where you can take, take advantage of the fact that the phthalo is a transparent color. It works really nicely for layering and glazing. All right, we've got another one over here. So let's paint that. This is kind of a long skinny one. And sketch it in. So kind of like they're maybe dan dancing, but also kind of bouncing how they're interacting with each other. I, a lot of times when I'm painting my own work, I kind of think of the whole process of, as having a conversation with what's going on. Like, if I do this, how does that change what's on the surface? You know, what's the back and forth? Because sometimes I'll start a piece with a, a vague idea, 
of, of what I want to do, but it will often change as I'm working because I'm trying to respond to what's happening on the surface. So that's where I kind of feel like it's a dialogue going back and forth. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, and then we'll add a little peak. Oh, no, I need, I'm missing one. I need one right here. So let me do that. This is kind of another little squared one. So we'll brush this one in. If you're painting with me, I hope you're enjoying it. It's very meditative to, you know, do this kind of repetitive shape and watch it come together. There's not a lot of pressure. It's, you know, even if it doesn't come out exactly like you thought it would, but you know, like if you're doing a certain oval, I'm like, oh, I blipped apart. Well, you just make the oval a little bigger, a super freeing uh, way to paint. You don't have to worry about it being super precise. Okay, I'm gonna refine this edge just a little bit. All right, and then let me do my little peak of phthalo down here. Kind of dividing up this negative space with just a little, a little peak of color. All right, good. Now as I look at this, what I think what I'd like to do next is this kind of red orange color. It's not the cadmium red light. It's now gonna be a mix of soft body colors. Okay, so hopefully here you can already see how, yes, the hue is different between, between these two. And because this mix is gonna be transparent, it's gonna give you some neat layered colors. So I'm gonna clean off my brush, clean it in the water. And, okay, good. Hopefully I've got that clean enough. And then, so I'm using quinacridone crimson. It is a transparent color. Um, if I didn't add yellow to it, it would be more of a blue shade red. But since I am adding yellow, it's going to skew um, towards orange. Okay. And I've got, I think I might have enough yellow. Scrape this up. I may have to add more, but I just scraped up the little bit that was left to mix. And maybe, uh, let me see. Let me pull this up. In the mixing, you might be, oh, sorry. In the mixing, you might be able to see how this, the quinacridone crimson is more of a blue bias red. And in fact, this isn't orange enough for me. So I want to add a little more of the yellow medium azo. Probably another, this is a pea size amount this time. And I use about half of that pea size amount. I don't usually take records of how much mix, you know, how to make it an exact color because often I'm doing these abstract pieces where I'm not trying to paint something necessarily super realistic. But sometimes artists, what they'll do if they're mixing color is they'll write down very specific proportions. I need, you know, one part yellow to three parts red or and one part white or whatever it's going to be. And that can be useful, especially if you're doing a piece where you have to come back to the same painting day after day. And, uh, you know, the acrylics darken down and you want to make sure that you are using the same formula or recipe of color if you're working on the same painting. You know what? I think I need more yellow. So, yeah, this is a case where I'm kind of like the cook. I mean, I'm definitely not this like this when I cook at home, but with painting, I'm like the cook in the kitchen, just, you know, adding seasoning as I go. <laughs> like, oh, I think I just need a little more yellow, right? So. And you know what? I still, I think I want a little more. So sorry guys, this is a case where I am having to kind of adjust a little bit more, but another pea size amount. Now we're just gonna go for it. I just want it to be a nice contrast to the, um, uh, what am I trying to say? The other, the other red, cad free red light. All right, that's better. So, and you can see how I'm scraping it back. That's showing a little, hopefully the sheen isn't messing it up, but you can hopefully see that transparency is still holding forth because both of these colors are naturally transparent. And I think that's more the color that I would like for this piece. So I'll put that back down, clean off my brush. 
and start painting. So as I look at this, we've got one here, 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 here. So kind of in a circle and then one at the bottom. All right, so we'll start with this one. Uh, I'm gonna wait on that because it's touching the phthalo. I want that to dry a little bit longer. So let's do this little one here. Oh guys, this is where I'm gonna readjust as I'm going because that is not, not where I wanted. So we're gonna add more yellow. And now I'm really, I'm just, I'm really going for it. So now we've got kind of two pea size amounts and I'm gonna take a tiny amount of my red. So sorry guys, if you're mixing with me, I know I didn't tell you how much red I put out, but I would say that's if I had to, to backtrack the mix here, that was probably half teaspoon of yellow to I'd say do like a quarter teaspoon of red. So if you aren't painting it, you want to, you know, if you aren't painting with me now and you're you're watching the video, try that. Half teaspoon of the yellow and a quarter teaspoon of the Quinn Crimson. Okay. So yeah, that's better. And in this case, what I'll do, I'll just wipe it off here. That's what's nice about prime canvas. You can do that if you do it fairly quickly. And then I'm gonna clean that color off my brush. And can't be this afraid. Real life scenarios. It is. Life scenarios. I cannot be afraid <laughs> to make what, I, and it's, it's not technically a mistake necessarily because no one would know it but me, right, from doing this. But if when you're working and you have an idea and you're like, ah, that didn't turn out like I want, don't be afraid to change it if you can. And if you can't, then again, no one's going to know. <laughs> so, um, all right, there we go. That's better. So I'm going to brush this out, my little tiny eggy jelly bean. Good. So now you can see more of that yellow is showing through and that'll be nice there. Okay, good. I like how that plays with the CAD free a little bit better than the darker red would. Smooth that out. Don't be afraid too to turn your brush all different ways and use it to your advantage when it comes to making these shapes. I have to remind myself sometimes because I'll find I'm struggling to make a a line. I'm like, wow, if I just turn my arm a certain way, that will, or a different way, that'll help. Okay, let's do, let me shoot a little bit of air on the phthalos here. Okay, now, that seems good. We'll start, we'll do this one down here. And I'm what I'm also gonna do too, is if you're worried about, you know, smearing a color, just, just paint over it very lightly. Don't scrub on it. And that way, um, if you do that, you're not gonna disturb the color that's there if you just do it really lightly, okay? And you see how as I'm over, this is the probably the best glaze example we've had so far because it's easier to see. But can you see how just by layering that more transparent orange on these two blues, now we're getting that uh, these neat colors underneath. Okay. And then let's see, we will put, let's put another one here. And so we're going to overlap two ovals, so there we go. And then we're going to bring that down and around. Oh uh, yeah, I love it. I love when those glazes come together, it's so fun. And fill it, okay. If you don't, see how there's a little bit of ridge here? If you don't like that, just smooth it carefully. You know, I'm sometimes I leave it, sometimes I smooth it, depending on my mood. I'll smooth it off a little bit, okay? And then moving to the original, I've got a kind of an important one center here, so let's do that. And let's see, I want it to touch here, and I want it to touch here. Because this way, it's like I'm having all of these um, jelly beans or bubbles kind of 
connect with each other, right? They, it's, it's a way of um, pulling them together in the painting. And so by having them overlap slightly, it's their way of being able to um, relate to other parts of the painting, right? It's connecting it. Okay, good. And then we've got one down here. So we'll mix that. And even this, so this lighter orange still creates even a different orange in the overlap. It's a little hard to see on here, but if you're doing it yourself, you should be able to see that, okay? And then I've got a little bit off the side here. So let's do that one. All right, I got a little excess paint on my brush. So I'm just gonna wipe it off and then pick up some of the color and wipe it on the palette paper. Don't ever be afraid of doing that as you need to. Okay, and then we've got a nice one right here that we'll do again, kind of focusing on the center of the design. And this overlaps a lot of them. So we really definitely want to get that one in. Okay. Lots of color overlap. Very cool. Get that going. Are your kids into painting, Marla? Any of your kids? Uh, you know, I wish I could say yes, they. I love it. I mean, my daughter is, I think she's more in like, <laughs> I think she's now getting into cosplay stuff. <laughs> she made a giant, oh. she took a dinosaur head and craft foam and covered it with faux fur and um, with giant big ears. I don't know. It's, it scared me when she walked around the corner because it was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, she she is, I think of the three, she she's in embracing her art mode. Now I will say my our eldest, the piano, um, I was talking earlier about piano playing with him. He really um he I thought he wanted to be an animator. So he's into art, but he actually hasn't he used to do a lot of doodling and stuff like that, but he hasn't made time for it lately. So, you know, I think hopefully with all three of them, they'll come to it. But I don't, I don't necessarily, I'm not seeing that any one of them, that that's their life's passion yet, but hopefully they will all feel comfortable using it as um, you know, relaxation, no matter what they end up doing. So, and that's really what I would hope for most people. I mean, I think most of us as kids, we love going to art and then we lose it when you think, well, I don't want to be an artist or I'm not going to do that. But then like, well, did you enjoy it as a kid? Because it may bring you relaxation as an adult, right? So. All right, so now let's do the pink. This is that nice, and I didn't, I don't know if I said this before, but that pink is kind of that analogous color to the orange that makes everything pop. So we're gonna add the pink, and this is where we're going to mix the Quinn Crimson color that we made our orange with. We're gonna mix this with some white to make pink. You don't need a lot of the red to do this. You're gonna need more white. And in fact, I think what we're gonna do also, my nozzle is a little clogged there, but I'm gonna use about a half teaspoon of the white. And I'm, I'm only gonna take a tiny amount of that red. I'm not gonna mix all of that together. So be aware of that, but I'm gonna mix the color first and we're gonna add some of the glazing medium. So it's usually better, I should have done this with the orange, but it's usually better to, well, I actually I did, but I should have used more of the yellow first. But anyways, it's always safest to add a little bit of the color and gradually add more because it's very hard to un, you know, it's like trying to unbake a cake. You can't really unbake it once it's mixed. So just, you know, start with a little and gradually add more. And I should say, start with a little of your darker value color, adding to the lighter value, because, um, you know, that darker value color, if you're not careful, careful can overtake your mix. All right. So I want it maybe just a little bit deeper. So add one more dab of that Quinn Crimson. Okay, so it's kind of a bubble gummy pink. I really like this soft pastel with these bold colors, but it, even though it's like a soft pastel, 
kind of like who it associates with, right? It becomes bold too. So now we're gonna use our glazing medium for the first time. This is really cool to have as part of your painting tool set because um, it is something that you can add to your color, no matter what color it is. And it extends the volume of color, but it also um, adds some gloss. So to have our gouache that's gonna be matte, we have our other colors mixed with soft body, they're gonna be semi-gloss. And then by adding glazing medium to this pink, so that's about a half and half mix of pink to glazing medium right there. We're gonna make it glossy. So that's why when you're final painting, when you walk by it, you're gonna see all of these different sheen variations, which I think make it really fun. Okay, so let's paint in the pink here. Oh, yeah, I didn't check it. So you know what, all I have to do is dab it. And that's okay. I will stick my hair dryer on this or my embossing tool on it real quick. Okay, now I'm gonna just do my best to paint lightly and I'm gonna pause on this one, give it a chance to dry a little bit more and I'm gonna paint pink over here and just be really light with it, okay. All right. So you can see how that dark value blue Shows through, and the um, darker value cad red shows through, and this orange that we mixed up here is going to show through as well. Okay, so again, there's some of that neat variety. Now I want the showing the um, transparency to be more dominant, so I'm going to actually just use my brush to mix more of my. Uh, glazing medium. So now we're talking probably two parts glazing medium to one part of my mixed pink. And so that'll give me a little more um, transparency here. Yeah. So that, see how that made it more transparent for this oval? I just wanted it to have a little more obvious transparency there. And then if for some reason, if I felt like later that was too transparent, I could just do another glaze layer on top and darken it. Okay, get that one going. And then we'll do another down here. Oh, Mr. Orange, this is orange, I don't know. I smeared you a little bit, that's okay. So what I'll do, I'll take my paper towel and just dab that and paint over it. I try to be really careful when I paint over that again. Just want to throw a quick time check out there. So we're at 11.50, so we have about 10 minutes left in the class. Okay. Just to let you know. Thank you. Yep, I definitely want to get, I think what we'll do is after this, um, I would definitely want to show the gold. So we'll paint this on here, this nice large pink oval. I also just posted in the chat, but wanted to let everyone know that tomorrow um, you will get a survey um, from Any Road, and we'd love it if you would fill it out and let us know if you enjoyed the class and maybe even point out in there anything you would like to see from Marla or Liquitex in the future, even if it's different paint ranges or certain projects. Um, we'd love to hear feedback from you guys. It helps us plan um, our classes in the future.
Definitely. Yeah, it's always neat knowing what people are wanting to experiment with or check out. Okay, so now this is glaze on top of glaze on top of glaze going on here. And that's how, like, you know, glazing isn't just for abstract work. There, this concept of glazing can be used for realistic uh, or photo real work as well. There are people who do, you know, tons and tons of glazes, 10, 20, 30 layers of glaze. And the more they build the glazing, the more visual depth the painting gets. So it's a, it's a really powerful painting technique to, to be aware of, no matter if you're painting more abstractly like this, or if you are, you know, painting something more representational. Okay, I think that's, I'll do one more little pink bean up here. Overlap that. Okay, good. So let's, um, let me throw the hairdryer on that. Now uh, let's do this because, uh, you know, there's another color here that I, I will mix up for you and show. And then the last is the gold. Um, Colleen, what's the rule on time here? Because I don't want to abuse the, the rule of how much time we have. I'm going to defer to Felicia. Felicia, if you wouldn't mind letting us know. Do we run over a couple minutes or? Yes, fine. Okay. So let's for this. Let me just turn this around here so we can have some more mixing room. Um, I'm going to take, this is a case where we're going to take a lot of glazing medium and just a dab of color. So that's half teaspoon of glazing medium. And we're going to just take the smidgiest smidge of, oh, you know what? We're not even going to have to mix that. We're going to take the smidgiest smidge of this, um, Oh, forget that. No, we're going to do it this way. Just right out of the bottle. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just a teeny tiny amount of the phthalo blue green shade and simply dab your palette knife and mix it in the glazing medium. And that's one of the coolest things to do. I love how those, that deep phthalo mixes with the glazing medium so nicely and easily. And that's it. We don't need to add any more. Um, you'll see how lovely and transparent this will be in a layer. Okay, so this is a case where we're getting a very light value glaze layer. I'm going to try to go somewhere where there is no pink since that's a fresh color. So we'll put it here. So obviously on the blue, you're not going to see it, but when you, uh, very well, but when it gets on the white, you're going to see that very thin veil of phthalo blue and glazing medium. And this just adds yet another layer of variety and interest. Okay. And then let's put one down here. Love it. I love how that just it's not a super, you know, it's not dominant, but it's important that it's there, right? Because it, it's how it kind of huddles with this other color and they make a third color together. So nice. Now I'm going to wait on that because it's right by the pink. Let's put this one up here. Little jelly bean bubble here. Now I am bearing, you know, this is going to be a little bit smaller oval shape. And then where else can I put one that isn't going to be, let's, sorry, let me stick this on it real quick. Okay, so um, where is it? This one. We'll just very carefully layer here. 
have a little peek out on the white. And then I'm just gonna not put it on the pink there. We'll just do that. That'll work. Okay. And then where else could we have one there? Oh, yep. There's one right here on the pink. I think that's dry enough there. So we'll just do that quickly. Nice. And then we'll do this largish oval over here. Again, see how it's breaking up visually those oval shapes and creating nice little other or organic geometric shapes, if that's possible. And then we'll do this one up here. Be really careful with that pink up there. Have it dip down. Cover that. Good. And there we go. I like this little, this is, you know, just a very, very thin glaze, but I think it's important to have it because it helps kind of really highlight that interesting, the interesting colors you can get through the layering. Okay, so quick comparison. I think we hit most of the big spots with the blue glaze. So the last step is the lovely, lovely, loveliest step, and that's using the iridescent bright gold. I absolutely love this color. Um, I use it in all sorts of different aspects of my work. I really um, find it to be handy. And it's not that I make gold paintings. I use it as a little accent. And so, you know, one jar has lasted me a long time, but having it, I think, just gives that little kind of pop, that little pizzazz that the paintings usually um, really benefit from. Okay, so this is the, um, so, uh, sorry, this is the acrylic gouache iridescent bright gold, which I think is interesting because when if we think of something opaque, I don't necessarily think of it as also being shimmery. However, I don't know why I wouldn't because, you know, metal is opaque, but it can be shiny. But with paint, I guess it's not something I would typically think about. But in this case, it's a really nice combo of that um, shimmery surface with the kind of velvety opaqueness and of the um, gouache. Now, if you look at the, gua uh, the gold color, it's not actually marked as opaque. It's considered semi-opaque, but in the world of things, it, it you know, it's just a really rich, uh, nice color to use as a little quick accent. So I think I can put a little tiny bean here. And I love that. That gold really sets uh, it off. It does. It's just a little kiss of color that works. Okay. Let's do this one up here. And yeah, in our color scheme, this one, you know, it's kind of part of the oranges, not complementary color scheme. So if you were using a different color scheme, instead of gold, you might want to use um, the iridescent silver in the gouache as your little accent highlight. Uh, you know, or we could have used it in this one too, but I think I like the warmth of the gold. Um, warmth of the gold with these colors. All right, so let's put this down here and just do kind of a little quick shape. And then we'll do a little nod to some gold here. And then a little oval here. So that's a lot of layers on top of each other. And when it dries, it's going to be even shimmerier. It's a little obscured because all the colors are wet. But when these dry, the opaques will be opaque. The or the gouache will be opaque, and the 
even though the, the gold is a gouache, the shimmer of the metallic component will give that sparkle. And then one little nod up here. And we're almost there, guys. Thanks for hanging in. Almost there. And one quick double check. I think it would be nice if I can put something here, but it's all right. I'll just feather it in very carefully. <laughs> all right, good. And let's kind of compare and see. Oh, we can do one more little bean here. And I think I want one more here just for this painting already, you know, it um, can't make the same painting twice. I don't know who would want to anyways. So I wanted to add a little more gold there. Okay. So I think that's it, guys. I would love to see what you've done. I don't know if we have time, if, if anyone painted with, but that's up to Felicia and Colleen. But uh, anyways, um, thank you again for spending time with me today doing this. And if you missed parts, you know, of course, check it out in the recording. And I look forward to any comments you might have, things that you'd like to see. That would be great to know uh, what's on your mind in regards to Liquitex. Thanks a lot. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone.